a little bit about what you do. Okay, so I'm what some people call an OG crypto artist. So basically I've been uh, in the space of crypto art since its inception. And uh, well, I started tokenizing memes on the internet a few years ago. I'm also an engineer, a developer. I started to work with the merge of technology and art in related to, N to the NFT ecosystem. What does it mean to tokenize memes or to tokenize art? Well, what it means is that you can make uh, something digital scarce. And this is not just going to disrupt the artist. This is going to change industries like the virtual reality industry, the gaming industry, because you can have things that are uh, like solid, like material, but in the digital world. So we can explain now what does it mean to, well, like this crypto art, what is it? right yeah and and so once you understand crypto which means you have a token a digital token that is scarce and that's a little bit counterintuitive for most people because we tend to think about um digital stuff uh as something that you can just copy uh make unlimited uh copies uh, the, that's the main difference with crypto. Like one Bitcoin is impossible to, to just copy because everyone would notice that it's not the original. So if I have this Bitcoin, but digital, like it's floating on the internet and it's already stored on the blockchain, it's inside the, the database that we call the blockchain, which is an immutable database. That means that everyone in the world can verify where this Bitcoin came from when where it lives in which address and they can see the moment it goes out in and out and it moves from one address to another it's a transparent database so once we have that we can link this transaction this bitcoin or ethereum transaction with let's say uh, a drawing let's say a, a trading card right so this is like like a vintage trading card from when I was like in junior high school. And, uh, and we used to exchange these cards in the physical world, right? Like this. <laughs> but now in the digital, uh, that would be impossible to do in just a digital frame because anyone can copy my, my unique card. So that doesn't make really sense. Like it's impossible to collect stuff that you can just print more but when crypto came into the scene then you can combine this design which is just like now i'm talking just on the digital world imagine this is a digital trading card and this is a bitcoin transaction so you can pair them you can you can make a link between these two and every time someone sends sends this token everyone can verify that is linked to this image so that token became special, became like a colored token. And that's what we call a crypto collectible. Okay. So that's super convenient for artists or any, any digital creator, like uh, anyone who, who is a, a, a content creator and is doing digital work. This is very convenient because you can make a special digital file that it potentially could have market value if you have followers, if it, if it had demand, or you can just do it like a certificate, like a, like a timestamp of what you are creating. And that also helps for copyright laws, let's say, or in what they call intellectual property. This is better than copyright and intellectual property because you can make one of these certificates that everyone can verify. You don't need an institution to tell you this is the true original, right? Everyone can do so, it for themselves. Yeah. Okay, so does that mean that because you are the owner of that card, it's the original, and you uploaded it, that, that means it's the original? Yes, it, like the first one that is uploaded tends to be the original because every other one, everyone can verify that it was like a second edition. Gotcha. Right, ideally. I, I know that I mean, I'm just giving like the most positive <laughs> uh, view of how this is playing out, but this is where it's going, 
right? That of course there there's a lot of uh, of piracy and 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 people like stealing the image and doing a different token. But I think those issues uh, are going to be solved the more the ecosystem matures. Yeah, because there are like mechanisms and technologies to prevent that, or at least maybe not prevent it, but at least to notify everyone that this is a second edition and is not the original that that someone else already tokenized, mm -hmm. which is very powerful. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay, awesome. <laughs>Okay, so here I'm going to go through different platforms that are that basically work kind of the same. This is the one that most people are using right now. It's called Rarible. I think in the last year they onboarded like most of the crypto art community and, and, and they just took it to a different level because it's very easy to use. So what you need to do to, um, in order to be able to interact with a platform like this is to have... A, the metamask wallet there are other wallets that you can uh, use but like this is the metamask right now is the standard for ethereum uh, crypto art and nfts so and uh, by the way nft comes from non-fungible token which is just a technique word that doesn't make much sense but when we say nfts we are talking about crypto collectibles scarce digital objects okay and this is what you're seeing here. All of these are examples of scarce digital objects. So for instance, this Mr. Monopoly over here is not just a GIF file that, uh, as the ones that you would share through WhatsApp with your friends. This is different in the sense that it's, it's correlated to an Ethereum transaction that we call a token. So th that makes it special and there's just one of five of these. So if you have one of these, everyone can verify that there are just five and you, can, you are borrowing or buying it from the, the person that mint it. So that's like a very interesting um, way to create a peer-to-peer -peer market between artists and collectors. And that's like the basic premise and the value proposition of crypto art. So you create a, a digital scarce object and you can sell it directly to a collector. Okay, now here, here we go back to the same question that I had. Can you go back to the Monopoly one one second? Yeah. Um, that brings me back to the question that I asked you before we got on the call, which is interesting to me. So regarding this Mr. Monopoly artwork, I love it. I think it's a really cool piece, but I know that this Mr. Monopoly uh, icon is a very popular licensed uh, piece of work. So I'm curious to know what copyrights are like in the crypto world and, and how that works. Maybe something yes, really that, that, that's a very interesting question. And uh, it's, uh, it, well, it's basically an open debate. Why? Uh, because Bitcoin in the first place was created uh, in order, like the technology behind Bitcoin, its first purpose is to make it very hard to regulate. That's the main purpose of crypto. Like it's, they call it censorship resistant. It's the, 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 the centralized nature of crypto. Uh, it's meant to be resistant to regulation. So that, that creates benefits, but also it creates a lot of inconveniences. So for people that rely on copyright laws to monetize their work, these mind, they might find a little bit difficult to understand this new premise because right now anyone can use any image to make a token, right? So. In order to be a crypto artist and make things right and prevent others from stealing your image from you, what you would uh, like to do is to tokenize your art before sharing it anywhere else. That way you will have a irrefutable proof 
stored on the blockchain that you were the first person in the world to create a token out of one image like this, let's say. I created this image a few months ago, right? So I could, I could have shared it on Facebook and Instagram before doing my NFT, but the idea is to do it the other way around. If I do it first as an NFT, anyone that, that steal my image or, or download my image and create something else with it, I can always prove that I did it first because I stored it first on the blockchain. Now, when it comes to enforcing copyright laws, that's like almost impossible. It's very hard because this is like the internet. This is, this is like a meme culture. So the, what, what, what a law, or let's say in a different way, to enforce a law, what it means is that some regulators have the ability to prevent someone from doing whatever they don't like, right? That, so that doesn't apply to the internet, if you think about it. So the, the internet is a, it's a worldwide decentralized network. And in order to prevent something from happening in the in internet, you will need to control the internet, and that's not the case. No, one, no one's on, in control. And the same happened with the blockchain, with Bitcoin and Ethereum. No one is completely in control. So there are mechanisms to make it transparent for people to prove that they were the first at tokenizing some artwork. But there are no mechanisms to enforce that someone else is not going to just take the image and try to, to, to sell it themselves. So, I love, yeah, I, I, just, I love the point that you made about meme culture, that the internet has, you know, it's kind of its own, its, its own culture. And that is a part of that is meme culture. And the way I see that with regards to art specifically, is that and especially with pop culture like the uh, alec monopoly is that we get to take images that are already created and build off of them and that's what culture does right like if you go to winwood and you see the graffiti it's like you see you see images of donald trump or you see images of basketball players with masks and it's it's not a copyright thing it's just that we're taking bits of information from the culture around us and we're adding more layers on it you know, and that's really cool. And then with regards to music, it's like you music is different because creating an NFT or, or putting, you know, um, a sound, a, a, a WAV file or an MP3 file on, on the blockchain, that's something that you are going to be able to verify. And you, even if you build on top of it, you're always going to know that the original track came from this artist. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's the core idea behind this because uh, I'm not like, I understand people that are pro copyright laws. Like I, I'm not even going into that argument. What I'm trying to explain is the, how the new scenario plays out and how to a, some extent the co copyright laws are going to be obsolete with this. It's what we are seeing with memes, as, as you mentioned. Like there's, there's no copyright law to prevent a meme. Right? right, right. But now the new paradigm and the new mechanisms of consensus are solving this in, in better ways. So the, the, way, the way we solve this is by creating an immutable certificate of the first address that tokenized something, a song, uh, 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 I don't know, a, a, a GIF file, an illustration, whatever it, whatever it is, whatever digital content. You can create a transparent, and verifiable by, by anyone in the world forever and ever. And, uh, and once you have that, it will always be super easy to prove that you were the first one in certifying that, even though someone else take that file from you and use it in Japan for whatever reason or in India. There's no way to prevent that anyways. Yeah. So yeah. this yeah. is just a, a different mechanism of, of consensus. Now, there are ways to prevent that someone is just, uh, or to fight back if someone is just stealing your work and, and monetizing it. There are, there are new mechanisms of consensus, and I'll give you an example. So when you're on Twitter or on most social platforms, now you have the option of getting verified, right? With a little um, mark. So that's what's happening in these platforms like Rarible. So 
because they are completely open and anyone can mint a token and put it on sale, the owners of the platform are creating a, 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 a system of reputation in where people get verified and that gives more confidence to collectors to buy from them. So if you and I want to make a big investment right now in a, in a, in a digital art that is tokenized, well, maybe we are not going to buy it from someone that we don't even know who he is. So the community of the artist plays a very important role. The more followers you have, the more people know about the meaning of your artwork, uh, all the, the explanation that is behind your motivations for creating art. All those things are very important because that gives confidence to your followers and your collectors and is easier for someone to invest in you as an artist than if you're some unknown uh, person on the internet, right? So it helps to prevent this kind of just stealing an image from someone else and selling it. It's, it's already, we are already working on creating those systems of consensus, the centralized consensus, which in my opinion, this is going to be the next uh, human, like the most powerful humans organizations of the next decade are going to be in this format, in the centralized autonomous organizations. Those are going to be more powerful than the pyramid uh, centralized organizations that we know nowadays. For sure. And uh, I just had another question come to mind. Um, let's say you and I are two artists and we collaborated on a piece of artwork and we want to upload it. So is there a way for us to have fractional uh, distribution or how does that work? Yeah, exactly. Like you can, you, well, once you have programmable money, you can do whatever you want. And that's, that's like the most crazy and interesting feature of, of all crypto. If you have money that it's open to anyone's uh, proposals to make it work better, we just have like a whole new ecosystem of competing proposals to see which money is going to be better. So as you mentioned, money that is programmable, that you can stream payments instead of like giving, a, giving you a monthly wage, I can just stream your payment every second that you are working for a specific project. Let's say I'm just coming out with ideas. Uh, or for instance, fraction payments, like, like, like uh, distribute those funds. So if you and I, we have a collaboration, we can set up in the smart contract that once that artwork is, gets sold for, for a, to a collector, the payment gets immediately distributed into the wallets of all the people that were um, part of the project. And that's completely automatic. Like there's no one in the middle doing it manually. It just happens that the moment you click to the buy, uh, into, the, into the buy button to, to get the order, the buy order, in that moment, the smart contract just triggers everything and the funds get uh, distributed. So that's amazing. Like that's just going to make all the financial system obsolete if you think about it. Right. Yeah. And now it makes me want to make a video about how to make a smart contract, which we can, we can do another time. Yeah. And that's going back to, to the question that, that we wanted to, to address right now about the fees and the, and the cost of the blockchain, because uh, that's, that's a problem that of like, it's for a reason, like the cost of putting a, tra putting a, a um, a transaction inside the immutable database that we call the blockchain, it costs money because you need to incentivize the miners that the miners are the ones building the blockchain. And you need to incentivize them to put your transaction inside the database. So when the network is too uh, crowded and there are a lot of transactions trying to go, get inside the blockchain, then if you need to speed up your transaction, you need to put a higher fee. So that's a system of competition. And there are solutions, like second layer solutions, they call them. But most of the platforms are still catching up. Like, I mean, we are in the early days, there are still problems. And one of the main problems that we have right now is that 
sometimes is still very expensive. So if you want to deploy a smart contract in the Ethereum network, that that's what you will need to do right now in order to create, uh, to start minting your tokens on a platform like Rarible, you need to deploy a smart contract on the Ethereum network. And that's a lot of code that you need to put inside the, the database. And that's gonna cost a lot of money. And right now, Ethereum, the price of Ethereum is at all time high. The, the network is super busy. So it's a lot of, like, it's cost too much. It's, it's not doable. Like, it doesn't make sense. Maybe just making a small transaction might cost you 20 bucks or 30 bucks. And that's, that's a lot. Like, who's willing to pay 30 bucks just to upload a, a, a meme, right? <laughs> but, like, for the sake of the exercise that we're going to do now, we're going to try to, to, to see how, how it works. But that's the reason behind the high fees. It's because people are competing to put their data into the blockchain and that's costly, that costs fees, or in the case of Ethereum, they call it gas. You, re you require a lot of gas to put that, that information into the immutable database, which is, it's a little bit of a downside, but it's, it's getting better every day. Got you. Okay. So we are back. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Perfect. So um, there are different websites. They call them block explorers. And that's the way that would be the technical way to, to, to find out if the fees are too high or what's the price of the fees. fees. So there's ETH gas station, let's say. That's, that's one of like a very easy to, to, to go through. And then you see here, the, what's the amount, the average amount of ETH that people are, are trading. So you go to your MetaMask and, uh, and then uh, when you're going to make a transaction, it will tell you how much gas you want to put into that transaction. So we can make that exit. Let's go to Rarible, okay? And then create, I'm gonna create a new token. I'm gonna make a single edition. So this is gonna be one out of one, mm -hmm. okay? So I'm gonna choose a file from my computer. So the other day I just created like a super easy meme to, to share it on, on Twitter, which is uh, Christine Lagarde <laughs> talking about regulating crypto. So, uh, so, ba so basically she's, she said something like, uh, if, there are way, if there's a way to escape, people are going to escape, like meaning escape from what? From your Ponzi scheme or what? So I, I, just, uh, I just created this like very like stupid meme. Let no one escape from our tax farm, Christine Lagarde, right? So yeah. let's tokenize that. So now I, ideally I should have done this before posting it on social media, in media. But I mean, anyways, if it, if it becomes famous, I, I, I won't mind. So, um, so here's, I, I'm just choosing the file from my desktop and then I open it. Here it is. Okay. So I want to put it on sale. Yeah, maybe. Okay. I'll put it on sale instantly. I can choose an instant sale price. Let's say, I don't know, ETH right now it is super expensive. We can check out how much is ETH it is, uh, we can go to coin market cap and see what's the price of ETH right now. So Ethereum. ETH price is here, $1,300, right? That's a, that's a lot of money So for one ETH. So let's say we want to sell this meme for, I don't know, just like a few bucks. So let's say 0 0.001, um, that would be... Uh, a dollar and thirty. It's right underneath. Yeah, exactly. Let's let's make it thirteen dollars, like this. All right. Yeah. That that would be more or less the equivalent of thirteen dollars here. Here it is. It's, it's giving you like the approximate price in in dollars. So yeah, uh, I'm gonna go here and click Rarible, which be, that's because it makes it a little bit cheaper. You are using a smart contract that the platform already have. So that, and I can now go and just fill all the metadata that I want to be stored on the blockchain along with my 
crypto art, right? So name, well, I don't know. What would, would you think is a good name for this meme? Uh, the tax farm? Tax farm, yeah. Or no one escapes or something like that. Um, yeah, well, that, I think tax farm works better. No, and then description, we can put this. No one escapes from our tax farm. Just add an E at scapes. Okay. Yeah. In the, in the, in the beginning, the first letter. Yeah, here, yeah. you're right. Cool. I love yeah. it. So it's good to check out all the typos because it's gonna, this is allegedly going to be stored forever. We can, in another episode, we can maybe go through the details and how valid are some of the statements of these platforms compared to other platforms and other blockchains. But that's like more of a technical thing and it doesn't really okay. matter that much. So royalties. This means if someone buys this art from me and then sell it again, what we call a secondary market. Uh -huh. And if they do that inside this platform through this same smart contract, I'm gonna get a 10% cut from that secondary sale. I can set it up, I can put zero, or I can put 50%, right? Like it, I'm gonna put 5%. Okay. So if it gets sold on a secondary market, I'm just gonna get a little cut from that secondary sale, which apparently is something like very important for artists, like get some small reward of sure. all those secondary uh, and, and, and more okay. sales. And properties, we can, I don't know, we can, we can invent some properties. Let's say dankness. I, I love it. Like, like, are these like tags kind of? Yeah, exactly. Like tags. Like just, I, I just use it for fun. Sometimes here in properties, I, I put some important information. Like for instance, author. What does that mean? Oh, like who it is. Yeah, who it is. The year maybe. 2021, right? Uh, technique, uh, DG file. Got you. So you can do whatever you want. You can put as many as you want. Okay, before you create the item, can you scroll up one second? I have a quick question. What yeah. is that choose collection? So that's your, um, basically you're saying if you're gonna upload it on Rarible or create a separate Ethereum or? Yeah, so the, the kind of token that I'm creating right now, that it's a one out of one, normally that standard is called ERC721 when it comes to the Ethereum network, right? There are also other kinds of standards and tokens. Uh, so if at the beginning I, I, I choose instead of create single collectible, you create multiple, then there are other standards, like the one that they use here is called 1155, let's say. So those are different names for different standards. And that's, every standard works with a different smart contract. Now here, what I believe is the difference between doing this one and Rari is that I'm, do, I'm using the smart contract that I already created with Rarible the first time I, I, I set up my wallet and everything, or I'm using the one that the platform is providing for me. I believe that if you want to do it now for the first time, maybe you can use this one and it might be a little cheaper. But I have an experience last week doing the same thing that we are doing right now, and the price was just too high, meaning that it was deploying a new smart contract with a new user. So that was kind of not doable. It was just, just too, too much. So before, before minting the token, it's going to ask you and you will need to sign with your wallet. So right now, um, we can just go, keep on going mm -hmm. and see how much the cost is gonna be. So we go down here, create item. And now it's uploading the file into a network that is called Interplanetary File System, okay. which is a super cool name. Like uh, it, it, it's just like a decentralized storage of, of uh, information. And okay. 
So you go to mint token and here, this is very important, it calls my MetaMask, my Ethereum wallet. And it's asking me, okay, do you want to mint this token? Yes, okay, how much? So look, it's gonna be 70 bucks to create it right now. I think, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit too much. It's just like the, the, the network right now is very busy and in order to put to, to get this transaction through in a relatively fast way, it's gonna cost me around 70 bucks. And that's taking into account that I already have a smart contract with the platform. So yeah. I don't know, we can, we, can, we can proceed, right? I mean, you don't have to do this right now. <laughs> you don't want well, to. I mean, we can do the example maybe. The, uh, the, the other way of doing it, like you just get confirmed and it's going to go through and it's going to take a few minutes. The other way of doing it is like trying to mint when the network is not so busy. And that would be mostly on weekends, on Sunday evening and yeah. stuff like that, right? So that's also a trick to prevent these high fees. But that's, that's one of the reasons that not too many people are minting at the moment because it's just crazy to be spending 70 bucks for uploading a meme, right? Right. And that's on Rarible. So uh, are all the networks, like if I go on any platform, will it be around the same price or does it vary depending on, on the... Um, it, it depends on, on how... Um, optimize the smart contract is it, it depends also on, on a lot of variables but one of the most important variables is how how well optimized is the smart contract how, if it's a little bit old sometimes it takes more fee because there are like new updates and and it's not like optimizing the data so we can try and see how would it be to mint it in a different platform let's say so we can do exactly the same now that we know I'm going to reject this transaction. Okay. I'm going to close here and we can try to do the same in OpenSea. Okay. Or in Artist Liberation Front. Uh, and both, all of those platforms that I'm using right now, they are like completely compatible. I can mint the token on, on uh, OpenSea and just and sell it on, on Rarible. And I can mint it in Arctic Liberation Front and sell it on OpenSea. So you see here is my, the, the same collection that I was showing you. This collection is stored in my MetaMask wallet. Oh, so whenever you connect your MetaMask wallet to a certain platform, your, all, all your artwork is gonna show in there? Or all your digital assets are gonna show in there? Exactly, all the digital assets that you have in this wallet. Uh -huh. Uh huh. got it. Yeah. So let's let's create let's see if the smart contract of OpenSea is a little bit better. More sub, submit NFT. I've, I actually I've never done it in OpenSea, but it's the same thing. So we go to create. Ah, uh, maybe because I've never done it with OpenSea, it might ask me to create a. Okay, so we're good. Christine Lagarde, so tax farm description, let, how was the description? Let no it was one. No one escapes the tax farm. Let no one escape uh, from, from our, let no one escape from our tax farm. It was just the caption. And then a lot of dramatic exclamation marks. Exactly. Uh, so I think we're good to go. I don't know if you're going to ask me for properties. Apparently not. Um, okay, tax farm has been created. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, so they are doing a trick here. They are apparently they are not minting the 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 token yet on the on the blockchain because he's not asking me to sign on MetaMask. So if it doesn't ask you to sign here and you're not spending funds, it means that that the this NFT is not on the blockchain yet. So they are maybe because of this problem of high fees, they are doing some, 
I don't know, some some trick to just let's let's go to my my profile. Okay. And while you do that, I have a question. Uh, so you have yeah. you already have Ethereum. For example, my MetaMask wallet is empty. So would I have yeah. to buy an Ethereum? in order to start selling or what what can i do to put my first artwork up yeah you definitely need to either get paid on ethereum or go and buy some ethereum in a in an exchange okay so th those are the only two ways to get some crypto or mine it but mining is like an industry and it's very it's like a whole new different world we don't want to get into that now but the only three ways to get crypto is by mining it, which is out of question right now. The other way is get paid on crypto. So let's say, I don't know, I make a design for you or an animation or whatever, and then I ask uh, uh, for crypto as payment. And the other one is to buy it. The easiest way, like the easiest and fastest way is just to go and exchange and buy it. So there are a lot of services. You can download the Cash app that is uh, that uh, Jack Dorsey is promoting, and uh, I think in the United States works perfectly. Yeah. Rem this, this is a, this is an important reminder. You don't need to buy a whole Bitcoin. Yeah. So every Bitcoin you can divide it. You can you can divide it in a hundred million times. So basically, you can buy $1 of, of Bitcoin or one cent. The problem is that transaction fee, that if the transaction fee is too high, it doesn't make sense to buy $1 if the transaction is going to cost you $4 or $5. Right, right. right. Okay, cool. So uh, I I know that I do have some some work coming up in the crypto art world and uh, i think i will be asking for cryptocurrency as a form of payment that's the best thing you can do yeah because you are not putting into risk your your investment like your money your fiat money that you have in your bank you can keep that on the side and then just get paid with your with uh, with crypto and then you start accumulating you start stacking sats that's the way we call it because like the minimum fraction of a bitcoin is called a satoshi so one of the things that we always encourage people to do is to stack sats so stack as many sats as you can as, as you as you want okay cool and thank you so much for taking the time are you coming down for the BitBasel conference in March? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to, for that event. Actually, I just learned today that, that Bitcoin 2021 is also happening on June. So I don't know, maybe I want to spend a good month in Miami. Stay. Just stay from March to June, just the whole way through. Oh my